Welcome to this next episode of the Second Resource Podcast with myself, Rufus Pollock, one of the co-founders of Life Itself, and Benita Roy, who's back to join us. And for people who don't know Benita already, or Bonnie, she's a leading thinker and practitioner of, we could say, the Second Resource, integral, metamodern, wisdom in general. Thank you so much for joining me again, Bonnie. It's a real pleasure to talk with you. For today, we again have a fairly like open, evolving kind of template. Our kind of starting point was this question of who gets to build the world we live in. You were talking with me about this, and it kind of covers ontological design. It covers discussion about we space. It discovers it covers topics of kind of politics and collective action. Do you want to start me off telling me a little bit about how you came to to talk about this recently? Like, how do we, who gets yeah. to build the world we live in? Yeah, so on Monday, I was invited to spend the day with a, a working panel for the UN broadly, broadly working around sustainable development goals. And I was in the sub panel on education. And it was also heavily attended by investors. And so one of the things that I was thinking of and what unfolded from that was this question of who gets to build the world we live in. And when you're talking to investors, that means how do you, your investment decisions is a big part of answering that question in the kind of reality that we live in now. And I was inviting people to think of themselves very explicitly as world builders, not just as investors or academics or modelers. Of, for me, I thought that this gave the whole conversation a very, a very serious edge or a very, it's realistic that I'm just not trying to make a living or persuade people, but that I'm an agent, I'm a world building agent. And so it matters what kinds of decisions I make. It matters what kind of person that I am. And yeah, we talked about this before we uh, got on. And so that's one thing, put a pin in that. And the other thing is when we think about this, it always, I, I say this a lot because I work with people who often come up to me and say, I'm a, part of a small group that's doing we space practice. I mean, there's different terms for it. And they'll say, you know, we find it very difficult to, to keep the group together or to, we always have a lot of difficulty. And then I'll say to them, but if you stepped back, if you were like an ant anthropologist from Mars and you came down and you're looking at the earth, you would see that as a species, we, we collectively have a huge impact on the earth as a species. Like we already are a collectively impactful, agentic species. And what is it, which maybe we could talk about this, why is when you get to try to, to build a deliberate conscious community, is it so difficult? And yet all the ways we act unconsciously or all the ordinary ways we act collectively add up to a huge impact on a global scale or an international scale or a whole regional or national scale. Like, can we look at the mechanisms that inevitably lead to a large scale collective action as what are the principles there that we can mine uh, for more conscious conscious community building and what maybe are the traps that make many of these large scales or through history, if you think of many of the large scale collective actions that humans have made through history, um, probably the oldest one is war and empire building. Um, what, are, what are the tr principles that make that possible? And what are the traps? And, I, and just to end this, I'm reminded of something that I read about Ezra Pound a long time ago. And in World War II, you know, he ended up being put in an insane asylum, probably because that that enabled him to not be put in prison because he was apparently anti-Semitic or, you know, he's a very, very kind of, very, very weird cat, right? So, but one of the things that, 
literally drove him insane was that prior to World War II, England and much of the Western world was still reeling from a kind of depression era attitude. And there was no money around, right? And then World War II happens. And all of a sudden, all these nations have huge amounts of money and investment to get the war machine going. And this kind of blew his mind. Like, why is there not enough enthusiasm to do um, positive things in the world at, at scale? Whereas when there are negative incentives and threats, uh, greed, these tend to move people and nations and money and financiers at a scale that is uh, very large. And I mean, the, the amount of industry that started at X date just before World War II in the United States, we will put it, we are building like B-52 bombers, like hundreds and hundreds. And this was a question that drove him crazy. Like, why is the peacetime okay reality where only people are just starving a little? And why is there so much inertia in that kind of reality? And how come we can't tap that same kind of, ignite that same kind of action toward maybe some ben beneficent or beneficial or restorative actions? This, these are unsolved questions. And I, I, I'm hoping you would solve them today, <laughs> Ruben. Yeah, we can talk about it. I, I think it's so great what you're saying. And it's an area also that I personally and with life itself are really interested in as well as this kind of, the two aspects of the personal ontological or even small collective development and then the political and kind of social at the large scale i think there are two parts maybe that i hear for me one is there's a point about yes we can act collectively at large scale. So when we say, oh, we're struggling in this like community group to stay together or do things, but look, we act at this big scale together is we don't act maybe very wisely at that large scale together, which is what you're saying. I think you're saying that. And, and then the second is why can we find the energy to spend money or take traumatic action for in for war, but not for positive outcomes. And even that metaphor, you know, fame like the US is the war on poverty, trying to mobilize that same energy in the 60s or whatever. It's like, we're going to have the war on poverty and that will spend money in that way. I, I want to also, you're talking to someone who once was an economist for a while uh, as an academic, not that I was mainly because I thought that it was a great tool for making social change. On the first point, I think this point I want to ask about, maybe I ask a question rather than, as you gave the example of war, we do act collectively, but maybe not so wisely. So what is it that you think these smaller collectives are trying to do that's different? We have the military, we have ways of organizing large groups of people, but it's maybe not a way, we're trying to move beyond that way of organizing. That's one of my, my questions, which is what people are struggling to do in those groups is we have ways of operating collectively for hundreds thousands of years but they often rely on command and control on a hier ultra hierarchical structures is that what you think people are trying to do in those areas or are they just missing or are they just missing out on some of the tips we could learn from how we organize scale society more broadly yeah i think that i, I want to say and then maybe i can find out why i want to say it that command and control is an outcome of something that is problematic. It itself is not problematic. It, it's an interest. I don't know why I said that, but one of the things, as we're doing this, just I uh, hope the audience, uh, the listening audience will be uh, tolerant of it. We're just trying to populate this question because we wanted, like you said, we want it to be lively and we, we don't come up, neither of us have a script to this. You know, one of the things I'm thinking about is there's two types of activities. So there are certain things that you can get done by motivating people with money. Here in the US, actually, many people that I know that go into the military are really not like God save the country people, but they're young people who want can't afford higher education and they go in because they don't know what the next step is. They don't wanna be poor. 
they sign up for the army. Basically, they do learn a lot of stuff. And then like my niece, then she put herself through school and then she put herself through law school and she could, would not have been able to do that without going to the army. And, but so money can motivate um, that. Money can motivate, let's say, greed on Wall Street, you know, these kind of huge collective systems. But then there's things that money can't do. Like you can't, many people have tried to throw millions of dollars. Zuckerberg tr tried to do this. He donated like $14 million to a school system in New Jersey and nothing happened. There's certain kinds of, if you think of the small communities that people are trying to build and they're struggling, throwing money at them will not solve the problem. It just won't. Like the problems... So now I'm starting to think that there are problems. So this may be a, an answer to what, so people would say, so money is an extrinsic motivation and you can solve some of these action at scale through extrinsic motivation. Maybe the problem is that wise action, collective action requires intrinsic motivation. Yeah, because I, it, it, we have a lot of facts base evidence that like going into a country where people are starving and just throwing money at it doesn't necessarily help or go, it sideswipes the issue because then they just become extrinsically motivated and then they don't care if like the other people are starving or I think that's a big part of it I, I I'm going to start I'm going to start there what do you think yeah I think it's I I think so if I got to set it out for me the way I've thought about this is that the the simple way I'd say is that in human collectives, in the positive sense, are there to solve collective action problems. Like we come together to do things we we can't do on our own. It's more. It, I'm saying more of the political level. Like we come together for for connection and food and shelter and, and relationship. I, but I'm saying more like when we come together at larger scales, that's often been to do things we cannot do on our own, essentially, I think. And that the, the, the obvious issue with collective action problems, uh, which is why we're coming together, is that there's this whole incentive to to shirk. And while we've given the example about war, this is the famous example. You know, I grew up, there's a story of Tar Horatio and the bridge. There's this, that they're coming to invade Rome and T Horatio, his other colleagues actually have run away actually in the, in the story. And he's left with two other kind of other soldiers to defend this bridge and hold it off until they can basically chop the bridge down and stop the Etruscans invading Rome. And so in the end, in fact, he doesn't die. He dives into the river and is shot with arrows, but he survives. But basically he's willing to sacrifice himself for the collective. And this is foundational to military values. It's actually a core piece of collective action, a willingness to transcend my own ego and my own survival potentially for others. And it can be in a much smaller way. It might be like, I'm, we're all using irrigation and I don't take too much water. If I take too much water and then there's not enough water for everyone else. And there's a great story about this, which Jonathan High and um, tells, but actually comes from Wilson's Darwin's Cathedral about religion and group group evolution, where he talks about Subak and these. I mean, he comes with anthropologists about this water religion and about how you how in Indonesia and Bali, I think you, you control who gets water from the kind of volcano spring the water from the volcano and how does it go to the different terraces there's all these carefully religiously enforced rules about dividing up this collective good and not overusing it and the other thing is also looking after the cleaning the water system so it doesn't get infested with rats and other things so this the, the question that we have often then as humans is how have we scaled our kind of ability to act collectively to do things that would benefit all of us but which is costly to me um and this relates deeply to your point that you're making about money and it, it's both it can be useful to motivate it but it's corrupting effects which is that there's a limit to 
self-interest in most of these areas there's a way in which instead we have to often cultivate our caring for others in a variety of ways um so the point i think coming to, if we just to go through it, it's like how is how has humanity do, do done that over history is I think roughly that we have evolved a combination of factors, mainly in cultural evolution, partly in our core being, which is greater prosociality over time, probably at least in early human history. Like we got we got more altruistic and more social and prosocial. But more recently, we did it mainly by creating either enforcement mechanisms or incentive mechanisms, mainly ontological in, and inner in nature. So the, the obvious one is like shame, which while socially also enforced is also like a deep inner thing. And then finally guilt in the West, God is watching me. Mm -hmm. So there's wonderful recent experiments where, for example, if you go to, they did this experiment, I think in Marrakesh, where it's well known in Marrakesh that people will negotiate hard, let us say, about certain things or drive a hard bargain. And they experimented when, with what happened when they, the Moazine's prayer was going on. At the moment when the Moazine is, is basically announcing the call to prayer and therefore reminding you of your religious uh, connection, people would basically behave more fairly. Mm -hmm. So we know that I think religion and other ideologies like that play a large role in allowing us to operate at greater collective scales and fundamentally thinking of us more of as a we than an I. So famously, the Christian church at the beginning had this treat like your brother. You talk about other people mm -hmm. in the church as your brother or sister. Uh, many religions do that and would encourage hugely kind of almost self-sacrificing acts. So going and tending to other Christians during plague, that was not something that actually Romans did that much normal non-christian romans but christians would do that so engaging in these personally costly efforts on behalf of others is a kind of core part of us acting more wisely in our collective so i think the reason that there's this deep relationship between addressing the climate crisis for example or acting collectively on things we'd like to build a wise society and our ontological development and our cultural evolution is there which is the reason we struggle to act together and, for example, maybe make sacrifices in the US, in West Virginia, to help people in India, depending on the, what, the climate crisis or how it's distributed, is that we need to have some identity with them. We have to have some sense of caring. And we're not yet all Buddhas. Mm -hmm. But there, there has been that huge shift in human history. And the, to finish this, there is a fact, whatever one may think of, obviously, current US society or current Western European society or, or many other sites around the world, we now spend huge amounts of our GDP, of our actual material wealth in transfers to people, other others in our society, and do so vo roughly voluntarily. So traditionally in history, there was tax collection, but it was almost always the emperor imposed it or whatever. Mm -hmm. In the last three or four hundred years, we actually have voted higher and higher taxes, higher and higher transfers um, in our societies. So there is this kind of direct direction. And I think the irony of the modern time to finish of what's happened is we. And again, there's about I, I should go on about this, but there was a bit of a confusion in the last 200 years where we got so excited about the market. We got so excited about the way that these systems aggregate our preferences when we buy things and we thought the market was really the the solution but in fact um there's more and more evidence that it's really the moral sentiments that adam smith talked about that underpin even the functioning of a market that there needs to be trust and even faith and kind of honorable behavior for a market to work there's there's these very nice examples about this now i could pick maybe i don't wanna, i don't want to pick too many examples but there's particularly but yeah i, I should herbert bows and, and gintis and his colleague worked on this quite recently and about the fact that if you start assuming everyone's knaves that everyone is basically dishonest and if people behave like that markets stop functioning mm -hmm. yeah so let me there's a lot here so one of the things i want to talk about is identity 
the pros and cons of identity. So yes, I'm going to back up and first talk about where does what I call evaluative reasoning come from? Like, why can people have moral and ethical conversations? And it turns out that in animals, they and in our animal body, in our perceptual body, we have two different ways to perceive the world. And these are two very well documented different perceptual neurodynamic systems. And what I mean by perceptual systems is how all the sense, sensory organs work together, right? So I'm looking in the woods and I'm trying to figure out what it is. My ears are helping my eyes. And if I could smell like an animal, my scent would be helping. Okay, so we're not, we're talking about this multivariate perceptual system. And what the first perceptual system is called egocentric because when it sees something in the landscape, it triangulates the location of those things relative to yourself. How far away is it? It's to the right of me, this far away, this is to the left of me, blah, 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 blah. And it, it organizes perceptual information relative to the, me, myself, here, your center line in front of you. And this perceptual system is primarily works with neurochemicals that are like oxytocin, which is both, which is both inclusive and exclusive. So this is, we know this about oxytocin. It makes you really love what's yours and really keep out and keep away what's exclusive. So the egocentric, my bone, my baby, my den, it's all related to the central values of the organism. But then there's an allocentric path called they're related to place cells in rats. And that is, it's like having a Cartesian mapping that this tree is next to that tree and this tree is behind it. This and, and not behind it because that references me, but it's that this tree's here, this tree's here, this tree's here. And if I go around this way, th they will still be in the same position, but my perspective changes, right? So for example, I used to live in this big A-frame house in, in, in the mountains and there was a huge like full ceiling to floor window. And when the dogs would see a squirrel out there, they had a dog door on the other side of the house. They'd immediately run that way to catch the squirrel. That's using their allocentric pathway because if they use their egocentric pathway, they try to run right through the window, right? So these th th that gives you a good idea of it's very important which ones are on. So when as humans, we take that perceptual system and we bring them into the virtual world of our psyche, when we simulate those perceptual systems, they become, we evaluate, we might say, should I, my neighbor said this, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to evaluate how the person behaved. This is now in my virtual assessment system. We can evaluate in the same two different ways. We can evaluate relative to our ego sense. Is this good for me? Is this right for me? How does this affect me? Or we can have an allocentric orientation to all the data that we're working with. And of course, this is one of the stated goals in Zen, for example, Satoria Kensho, is you realize that what's really happening is not doesn't have anything to do with you. Like it, it, the world is this whole kind of, not objective, but it's a system that that isn't driven by like your cares and your fears and your blah, blah, blah. And so one of the reasons why I think that is what we have to do, I think you're right. In the past, we've increased the circle of care by the egocentric evaluative system. It gets replaced by larger egos, my tribe, my nation, my church, my religion. But in a global society, that becomes I would say even more problematic because now you just have very large coordinated ego, egos fighting other very large coordinated egos. Whereas at least when it was only a few people, you just have these clashes. And so, so, and this is proven like in, in 
all the years, the 30 years war between the Christian religions in, in Europe. So I don't think, I think that stop is no longer sufficient. You can't have people, you're just coordinating egocentric type evaluative reasoning on larger and larger mass collective action. And then if those two groups are clashing, it becomes even worse. That's one thing. And then the other thing you talked about, you talk about trust, we could go back to that. I'm going to skip that. But the other thing is, <clears throat> so we need a moral sensibility that really is very allocentric at a very large scale. This is an interesting question because that does not mean to go into objective thinking because objective thinking, then you're just going to have game theoretic stuff. And it's, it still has to be evaluative reasoning. It still has to be immersed in values, but not your frame of reference has to be extremely aperspectival. We could talk about that. But the other thing you hooked on in terms of the markets, one of the ways, and, and this is something that is proven to be potentially very harmful. We know that, but it, there's potentially some promise in this. And that is what I call, instead of coordinating people by this increased identity, which has the problem of inclusion and exclusion, I talk about um, capitalism. I talk about certain types of agency, which are, um, which I called enforced compulsory social protocols. Fiat money is an enforced compulsory social protocol because every, to do anything, everybody has to go and buy something. So if 99% of the people in the world are forced to be in this financial system, then they're going <clears> to <throat> act as a massive unit of agency. And this is also a big problem with AI because it's going to massively enforce, it's going to massively coordinate enforced social protocols, right? So everybody, everything you do will have to go through the internet, on the cloud, AI will be watching it. And so you'll get this huge leverage of mass coordination. But there is a potential that there are social protocols that people could design that would have beneficent outcomes. And so people don't have to be constantly conscious and allocentric but that they are ritual, these protocols are ritualized maybe sometimes through shame, but they're enforced somehow and they're compulsory in a certain way such that it becomes a beneficent and unconscious unit of agency. So that's a couple of things that, that I've been working on. So like just this simple example, if every dollar someone spent 75 cents of that went to restorative ecology, people would still have to use the dollar and they could still want to buy things yeah. and this and that. But behind the scene, the social protocol is doing something beneficent. So you wouldn't have to change. It's very hard to, to people. You need very allocentric people to design a social protocol like that. But I don't, but to get 99% of the people on planet earth to be operate at that level of evaluative reasoning, given that generations after generations have not been in that social system, I think is probably not possible. Yes. Like you can, uh, if you like a vanguard or let's just put it like a, a smaller group can help design things, which, which steer in, in a positive or a negative direction. And then just to come back, I think it was a really beautiful point about identity and the limits of identifying with larger and larger kind of abstract entities. I, I can basically, so one way things have gone, just to take it through human history, is I've created large groups which I see myself as connected with. Start with, I see myself and my children as somehow one, or my ego can see my connection with my child for good biology reasons that we've got a genetic connection with them and so on and then i can expand that to my kinship network and then maybe my tribe and we can have these large groups and there's a limit to that as you say and i think there are a couple of limits to that which is one is it's just hard to scale to the planetary scale like it's just it's not easy 
And the obvious point that ironically it can make things worse as those groups get bigger, like the Second World War, we had the, the, the most terrible war in human history, tens of millions died. So there's huge identity within the groups, but then they're fighting each other. There are a couple of points I want to make that, which is that in parallel, there is something that seems to be going on. So for example, let's take in modernity, because these things really happen, in, I would say, roughly in stages. So in modernity, we have the development of nationalism and this idea of nations, which is this breakthrough, right? People are consensually paying tax. It's not just the emperor saying you've got to do it. We're now, I see myself as an English person or as an American mm -hmm. or as Italian. And that took decades or years and there's this beautiful phrase like when italy was unified in 1871 the prime prime minister said basically we've made italy now we must make italians because at that point i think under 10 percent of italians spoke italian like one in 10 people in italy could even speak to each other and so there are these huge nation building projects but the other thing that happened was there was another level of ideal which was the declaration of human rights which was this vision that developed in modernity of that we are one so no longer e and i think that goes on even the pre when we had christianity or something like that we my local identity was probably with my community my local geographic community maybe even my church and the idea of being part of christendom we all know many people didn't identify but at, at the highest ideal level that was going on so I think we're at a moment where we have this desire to move beyond the nation to this planetary le level. And that's hard, what we're saying. That's mm. not easy for us to do. Just take a very common debate at the moment, which is about immigration. Many people, I don't know, maybe listening by say, I'm a progressive. Oh man, I'd really like them to go. I, I, I don't want that. I want immigrants to be treated well or whatever. But then if you actually went to people and said, do you want to equalize income with India? Do you want to have open borders? even most the most progressive people are probably no i don't want to do that right. <laughs> i don't want to allow free immigration from india to the us so there's some kind of limit in us still now that you i think the connection here to what you were saying was that the people who do epitomize that in human history are sometimes sages you think of buddha yeah. think of christ or other figures that these are people who were like, I will share everything I have with others. I am willing to see every human being and maybe even every animal, every living thing as connected with me and therefore worthy of care and love. And not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have dominion over it. I'm going to live in kind of equality with it. So I think we're struggling at this moment in, in human history with moving to the next level of that identity. Now, as you say, that might even be transcending the ego identity to move to this next level of human, of planetary flourishing. And yeah. for to us to survive the collective action problem that we have is going to require this deep shift in our consciousness. And which is why the things that we've done so far, culturally and religious wise, have never done it. And, convert, and the social structures like markets or voting have not allowed us to solve collective action problems. The thing that's really allowed us to solve collective action problems most of the time is a new sense of wider identity and care. Yeah. And we move beyond the word, I actually word identity, because you said it has the ego in it, but a new levels of caring, enlarge yeah. this circle. And that now connects to this ontological evolution. And for me, this is the connection why at like, our original theme for this, Bonnie was like conscious communities and deliberately yeah. deliberate spaces. Why is there this deep connection for me and life itself between the second renaissance, a vision of how do we transition to whether we want to call it planetary civilization, whatever yeah. you want to call it. And these we spaces and these small groups is the modernist solution of markets and armies and voting really actually works in the context of some large system of care and that's really what will take us to that level and we don't know how to do that we don't yeah. know how to have a world become bodhisattvas yet yeah yeah okay that's perfect because it, it's a segue to now i'm going to make now i'm going to build on what i said to the next level because of 
it was a perfect segue. So one thing is, I'll tell you a story first to give you some sense of it. So I was teaching this module on perception in the allocentric and egocentric pathways and how that translates into evaluative reasoning in our psyche and mind. And this one woman, we had in the second session in the cohort, she said, I came home, she'd taken the, the course. The course was like five or six sessions. And after a couple of sessions, I came home from a long trip and she had an outdoor planter with marigolds and there had been a frost. And when she came home, like her flowers were frosted and droopy and stuff like that. And she noticed that she looked at them and, they, and she was sad because she was evaluating just this objective situation. And then it pop, then she popped out and she saw them as the life cycle of plants and the, you know, and this and that. She went into an allocentric and she noticed this because we'd been doing this course. And then I knew she was right on the verge of the third insight. And then I said, but you can have an allocentric understanding of your egocentric love of the plants. So you're not blended with it, but you understand there's something beautiful about the first, also the first situation. So it becomes like T.S. Eliot said, now you see it for the first time. And I agree with you. I think that um, there we are constituted by these levels of concern. Nobody, even... The, even the, like the Dalai Lama, when he says, when they, like they, he never criticizes China's relationship to Tibet. He never criticizes, there's a talk where I hear, he, somebody asks him, why don't you denounce Buddhist self-sacrificing, right? Because in your religion, it's wrong. But he would never do that. And that's because he has an allocentric understanding of these normative, egocentric kind of ways in which we live. So you would never expect a person to sacrifice, except for Abraham, I guess the angel taught him the allocentric uh, lesson, but you would never, you would never blame someone for um, saving their two children by killing three strangers who wanted to kill them. So it's not like you said you kill three people and save two, because that's just not real. That's not ontologically real in the value human value sphere or the animal value sphere so what we want to do as if you're designing if you're a person that's trying to design these social protocols you need to be sensitive to that first layer up to a certain point and i agree with you i don't think that is then expanding that identity beyond something that you don't actually experience in real life. I don't experience uh, the nation state in real life. It's, a, it's an ideology. I can only identify it as an ideology. Yes. And so there are certain little bubbles that we have to, of, of local care that we have to preserve. And we have to say, if we're going to get people to coordinate at a larger level, how do we honor those circles of trust and have them seed larger connectivities. And I think the postmodern goal of having one global reality just gets the only way you can address that is through competition at the ideological level. That doesn't make sense. So I think that's important. And so I agree with you there. And then there's a limit. What that limit is, I do not know. But I'll just start there. Stop there because I forgot what the, <laughs> the other thing no, That's the good. Thing I, I think... What we're saying is this point of expanding the self, there's a point of transcending the self. And I think that the, there's an aspect where some of the way we've it's worked to get to larger scales of cooperation, you know, that, for example, US taxpayers pay billions of dollars each year to fund research on drugs, many of which, or basic research, some of which they will benefit from and some of whom won't. We pay for these massive public goods, these shared goods. Mm -hmm. The way, the hack we've had is expanding this kind of sense of self. And there's a point where that, there's a limit to that. 
or where the, the self has to be transcended. We have to move to the big S self. Mm -hmm. And that's, we're reaching that, that point. It's also been the fact that we've exacerbated the collective action challenges we have by supersizing our technology. I think there's, we, I think it's a EO Wilson's phrase that we have Star Wars technology with Stone Age minds and emotions. And so there's this, there's this aspect which I guess is therefore key in this thesis. I, I don't know that just want to reiterate this to people, myself and to people listening to, is that in much of the world, let's say today, you'll see placards even of, we don't need climate change, we need systems change. And what we're almost saying is to address a collective action problem of the scale, the planetary scale that is the climate crisis, we don't just need systems change, we need inner change. And maybe a little bit subtler than even inner change, it's like collective inner change. It's an ability to be different, not just individually, but somehow collectively. And that's hard. So to go back to the, the story, to make it very concrete for people, the toy example I think of for myself is I've lived in shared houses. And I think maybe many people here at some point in their life have lived in shared houses. And I've even got a, I've lived in a lot of them. And there's most of the time there's some issue eventually about food or washing up. And I even actually have a book, I don't have it here, but called I Lick My Cheese, which is a collection of notes from people in shared houses. Now, the question is how do you, let's say the washing up is not getting done. What are the ways we have at the moment that we do is we're gonna, we're gonna, I don't know, install a camera and then we're gonna find people when they don't do their washing. We're gonna video record them and track it and then enforce it in some way. And that just has major limits and we could go into that but the question would be is if there was some way for us to build not only greater fellow feeling but to resolve tensions and conflicts in the house and actually when we talk about we space we talk about our own sense of transcending myself i got to be there is no me rufus i am one with the other people in my house <laughs> yeah so I would, I have, I, now that's I, a bit I, crude but i'm just saying that no what, it's not crude i have a lot to say about that so yeah. what happens is one of the most fundamental, the more fundamental the value evaluative system is, the deeper in an animal nature it is, the harder it is for us to actually get rid of. And in this case, I think that it's much, much more realistic that we don't get rid of it, that we respond to it in a different way. Like these people who live in like open sex communes, they're trying to get rid of jealousy. It's impossible. Right. So how do you respond to it is a different thing. So that so let's back up. One of the biggest when people get married when they're young, they usually don't have the who who cleans up problem, who messes up, who uh, because they've never lived outside of their parents house and they've never had that prerogative. But if people who have lived by themselves get married later in life. You have something very deeply territorial going on. It's ex I've coached a lot of relationships. And what happens is it's fundamentally a territorial instinct that then gets projected as, oh, he's a slob, or he doesn't care, or he's not doing his thing, or she's this, or she's that. All of that narrative is useless. Because what's happening, what's operating is something that is extremely primitive. And what needs to happen in relationships, so this is true in one-on-one -on -one relationships, I've gone through it myself, and that is you have to get rid of the ledger. If you're going to live with people in a trust relationship, you can't have a little ledger of who's doing what. And, and of course, everybody goes to the ledger because we are market capitalist data-driven people. But that's not the heart of community. You just have to say, now it's different if somebody's making a mess because they want to piss you off. But mostly they're just living in the milieu that they're comfortable with. And that amount of mess pisses you off. So if it pisses you off, the energy arises in you. So the only person that can solve that energy of being pissed off that arises in you is you. So you either learn to ignore it or you clean it up. 
the, the problems are rising in you, not the person who, this move, this is the malware goes very deep. You cannot be in actually deep relationship with people if you have a ledger, who's paying who. And this is, you see it all the time in partnerships, in relationships, they don't work. Whose money, one person's money, and that money's worth this and this. You have to get rid of the ledger for authentic community. That's step one. And in most of these authentic communities, the first thing they try to do is what you said, is make the ledger explicit. And this is a disaster, but it requires something. It requires, it requ in order to get rid of the ledger, it requires you to start with what you're after, true community, true communal, relational, authentic, relational understanding. Now, that's a hard nut to crack, but it is a truth. It is a fact. It can't be overcome. You can't outdo this. This is an extremely deep operating feature, not a bug, of human relationship. So for me, like when I work with people, okay, and I'll give you an example. This is my funny example. So I once bought I once bought a chainsaw from my husband. He wasn't my husband at the time, but for my partner at the time um, for Christmas. And he really liked it. And on our dining room table, we had all our Christmas presents, right? And so the chainsaw was there. And then after Christmas, we picked up all the stuff and he left the chainsaw there. And I would come home from work every day seeing this chainsaw on my dining room table. And I would watch how angry I got. And this fascinated me. Like, I would like one time I came home and I almost said, You wouldn't put a chainsaw on your mother's dining room table. Like, I watched these things come up. And of course, I tell this story, and most people that I tell it to, they're like, Why? Yeah, he's a jerk. Why do you keep the chainsaw on your dining room table? But you see what I'm saying? I just spent all this time wondering what, what is it? In the grand scheme of things, for him, it was his chainsaw. He likes it. He just left it there. For me, it's all this kind of deep meaning, symbolic. And I watched day after day, week after week, coming home from work. My eyes would go right there. Sometimes I would, oh, maybe he took it down. But I didn't want to spoil the experiment. But if I said, can you just, I'm just going to put that chainsaw downstairs, right? It wouldn't have been a big deal. But. This is, this is what's called mindfulness in action. Like yes. to really understand that most, and so most of the conflict in these relational communities gets bumped up to a narrative level. That's not really where the problem's operating. It's in these deep evaluative structures that are pre-constituted by things like simple territoriality when you live with people. And I think we need to recognize that and let it be. Like there's a certain point, let it be and try to balance your own system. And then one day I came home, I can't remember what it was and it wasn't there anymore. And of course that, and it was silly that it made, it was felt so nice <laughs> that it wasn't there. But you have to, so this is what I would call real inner work. Um, yes. And I think people think too much that inner work is getting to be more and more like cognitive complex and stuff, but that's just bumping. That's just, but so that what happens is I, I'm more cognitively complex than my husband. So I could have certainly won an argument in, in terms of hierarchical complexity of the argument, but this is not where yes. the actual experience, lived experience lives. I want to build on that because I think this is this then brings us to the crucial point for me, which is that let's call it ontological development if we need fancy, but in a cultivating our inner capacities is multidimensional. And that as you say, I don't know the there can be overemphasis on the intellectual or the co cognitive complexity or hierarchical complexity end of things. And what I would call here is the ability to ultimately have no reactivity to, I remember Doshin Roshi, I was having this, this integral Zen guy, he was like, there's this and there's this. And the ability to have, maybe, I don't want to say that you don't have reactivity, but for it to dissipate. Yes. 
incredibly quickly and to be mindful of it, to be, oh, I'm getting reactive. I'm getting triggered about that thing. This skill is, I think, really orthogonal. So the, the level of correlation between, in my, I look at my own life, but I see in others between people who have great cognitive complexity and this great non-reactivity or great skillfulness in, in dealing with their reactivity is really unrelated. And I think there are different capacities to cultivate. And as you say, the latter skill, I think is actually far more important most of the time, at least in, in living in community and relating with others than the skill of hierarchical complexity or cognitive complexity. I suppose the thing I want to relate it back to for also is how does that I, I've just I guess I've just seen so many groups and including ones that like things that have happened in life itself, breakdowns and, and interpersonal conflicts that then don't get resolved. I suppose the question that you was leaning us back is like why is there such an interest in our community and these kind of practices around this these kind of capacities when we can scale our society in these other ways. And I guess the answer I have is that most of the time we scale, you know, when I've seen the way that many not so functional co-living arrangements scale is basically people revert to, I'll have my line of the fridge, I'll leave the house, I'll write passive aggressive notes. And there's, there's just upset. And eventually someone that's resolved by someone leaving or creating basically our borders, you know, we have, but we don't really move to this level of, as you say, you could have resolved it by just telling your husband to move it. But instead you opted for this going for like your own, dealing with your own reactivity and trying to cultivate some new capacity. Yeah. And it was, I was wondering where does that arise from? Like I could get rid of the narrative, like, when that narrative about his mother came up, I'm like, oh my God, that's a narrative. But I, what I noticed, it's deeper. I kept on wondering, where does this live in my body? Where, what are the causal mechanisms inside my body? Like, how deep do they go? This is why I know they're very deep because the narrative, I would get rid of the narrative. It would pop up. I put that aside, put this aside, put that aside. Put, I'd stare at it sometimes. And um, so I was using it as it, a, a learning experience. It was extremely fascinating. So that's why I, what I was doing that because I just I was really under I was doing vipassana with the chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, and the question just let's like loop this back to the beginning. Connect. So wrap, so I got two ways I want to go in, with you. Like this, just so I set them out for ourselves. One is I would like to come back and deepen into. So what are the practices? What are the spaces, I would call them deliberately environmental spaces, but what are the kind of environments and practices that support uh, per individuals, but more we'll say even groups in developing this ability to, you know, to, to function in a well way and develop these capacities of allocentric, for example, approach. And just to loop back and make an observation, when you said at the very beginning, I'm here at the UN and they're talking, and there's this question of who gets to build the world we live in. And, and an observation, the people who often today seem to get to build the world we live in aren't really maybe coming from this place, such a wise place. The point I would say is because they're not, this work is not going on. And we currently, for a variety of reasons, reward with resource and power I mean, this is a long conversation, but we tend to reward things that aren't so this kind of wiser way. And I want to, I just want to make that connection back to our very first question is cultivating these capacities of, for example, looking deeply. In your example was the chainsaw, but it could be about like, what's in my desire to earn lots of money or be powerful, you know, observing mm-hmm. by grasping, like in your case, your grasp was like, get that off my dining room table my grasping might be why why does no one read my substack posts or like yeah. whatever it is going like why do i want fame why do i want power why do i want wealth you know really observing where things are coming from in myself and then at really looking where am i coming from can i come from a wiser place can i let not deny that there's that energy in me that there might be right, a problem, right. but not be given by it 
So I want to come to that. What have you seen out of all your experience that allowed, you can look at yourself personally, but when you've seen others that cultivate this, what are the factors in people? What are the factors of the environment or the practices people are doing? And I'm not, I know there's not one answer at all here, but what are the different ecologies that you've seen that have worked well in cultivating these kind of capacities? I think one of the most fundamental uh, like so I, I I'm gonna say that your question is what is necessary but obviously not sufficient we can't put on everything that is sufficient but what are the necessary elements to to this and I would say one of the most powerful ones is what I call voluntary obligation or vow if you don't as long as you have the option, the two foot option, get up and walk away, you're not going to work. You're not, you need, you need to make a voluntary obligation for long enough until you, you crack it. It's like Buddha. I'm going to sit under this fucking tree until I figure it out because it's really hard work. And I think that this is why certain old-fashioned things like military service have made have in the past and it's not so much the, the, the case or monastic discipline monastic life have have traditionally been theaters of transformation because there's no way out and I think that we don't live in a world where you want that to be forced on you so it has to be a voluntary obligation okay. So yeah. I remember this thing with the ledger with my husband. First, first he was making more money and then they sold his business and then I was making more money and then I, the recession came and I lost my job and then he had to go out and get another job. And this whole relationship to who was ahead of who and all of this, even when I knew I, I, I just got so tired of having the ledger and I just wanted it out and it just, I was so committed. So I think being having a voluntary obligation to liberate oneself from these structures and understanding that it's ridiculous to think you're going to, you're going to save the world if you can't liberate yourself from these structures. And so many people think they're doing really well and being activists, saving the world, and they're just driven by these unconscious desires. And so that's a kind of bypassing. So that's what I would say is probably, so you make a voluntary obligation, you make a vow and you, it actually may fail, but you're in the game really long enough to know that it's a failure. You learn from that failure. Uh, but without that, I don't, I think the work is too hard and, and it's too easy to think the setbacks uh, are absolute when they're not. You just haven't you just haven't sat with it long enough. I think it's so brilliant, Bernita. I, mean, I have to say, I think that the end, this it resonates with other things. I had a conversation also with Daniel Thorson and also my own experience that. where he was saying like pe being in a situation also where you're going to rub up against things, you're going to rub up against things that annoy you. And if your default setup is that I can leave relatively, um, that it's just not, you're not really going to, it's not really going to transform. So this, so just to summarize a voluntary obligation, a vow to participate in a theater of transformation and it can be your marriage, as you're saying. It can be, you know, it can, but in, without that, you, you're not. And I think this is also related to one of the sort of sad ironies of the moment of the greatest need for us to grow as humanity, at least in a lot of the Western world, we're in a moment of hyper-individualism where no one wants to make commitments. You know, I mean, I'm even now a bit, too old i was around before dating app mm -hmm. but i'm just amazed you know i talk to people or it's just no that's oh, i'm going to date multiple people at once like, just every area of our life i'm not living here for any length of time it's like i can move on we idolize flexibility yeah but and the thing is it's i, I keep saying the malware goes very deep right yes so for example there are psychotechnologies 
invented by good people today who would agree with us that are actually designed to undermine ex this essential need. And I'm going to go online and say it. And for example, very many people in our milieu are interested in and practice internal family systems. Yes. It's just a way to get out of voluntary obligations because now you have a lot of participants and they're all doing different things. And then you have the drama and it's, it's in the wrong direction to a voluntary obligation. It's up to me. This is what I'm doing. I don't have to negotiate. Like all this is actually in the wrong direction. It's another layer of the <clears throat> ego. Yes. That's very, very sophisticated at squirreling away from this. So now this person has got, this sub-personality has got a part and this person, no, you are a whole person. You can make a voluntary obligation. Then you notice that these sub-personalities and narratives that come up are distractions from that. That's what they are. They are little outs. They're a way for you to walk away. But we actually teach this encourage people to think of themselves as built this way. So this is how far, like for me, this is, people don't understand if they really, really want intentional community, they really, really want to build the world that they want to create. We have to take these things seriously and be extremely vigilant of how deep the malware comes. And, th and then this is the pop-up school. I have students who have formed voluntary obligations. It's very helpful for them. And we need to understand other things. Like I teach a module on trust. People have different trust styles. Once people know that people have different trust styles, you're not like, oh, he's not trustworthy. And we, we do this exercise where you can easily find that this is your trust style. And then you find out somebody else's trust style is different. So in a healthy community, you just have a lot of different trust styles. And the way it works is, let's say you and I have pretty close overlap in our trust style, but you trust this person. And I'm like, oh man, he gives me the willies. But because I know you trust him, then you have this network of trust and you have these like kind of different waves of more or less trust, but they overlap. So understanding like that people have different trust styles and why people are so confused about trust is also, so there's many, many different points of confusion where people have made up all kinds of stuff about how to improve community. And they're based on, I think, really erroneous assumptions. And so I think we have to be rigorous in the pedagogy. And yeah, so. Yeah, I want to say I really agree. And I think my colleague Valerie, who runs the Bergerac Hub here, she comes from a really strong Zen background. I think that she often is pointing out, which is sometimes we don't want more self-development. Like one of the reasons we have collective and one of the things we see in the Bergerac Hub, again, people come for a month, getting a group of people there, we've tried to have a fairly loose, what we call frame. And there's one hour of collective care a day that people need to do at the same time. That is a stretch for many people. Oh, but I've got a Zoom call. Or, I just didn't feel like getting up this morning. I'm tired. But like that ability, which you go back to the army, th this aspect is deep. And I think something I want to emphasize, you say is this other version of it that I see is I don't, which is subtle, but there's an aspect of, I would call abusing feelings. I've got to listen to my feelings. I don't feel like it today. Now it's subtle because sometimes we have oppressed ourselves and others yeah. there has been a whole thing of this and there's the aspect of the military you know, i don't care how you're feeling son get out of bed give me 20 there's a lot of oppression and other things but there's this aspect where we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and we're also um idolizing i've had it like i've even had this one i found weird of, i've got to put on my oxygen mask first i've started hearing this phrase quite a lot i don't know if you ever heard it where but people use it to me like look i'm quitting this program because i've got to look after myself and you're like but what self it is exactly, you say, is it the true self we're trying to cultivate or the the ego? And so yeah. I think this point that you're getting at about IFS, in, in general, this point of there's a lot of ways we can get out of the, com the confrontation. 
And the final one, I've always been really interested by a program called Landmark and the yes. Landmark from Est. And people always had this thing, but I think there was something you really were onto, which is they don't do it anymore, but it was originally like, we don't even want to lock the doors. You can't go to, you can't go to the toilet. But even today, people get confronted that they have to be, that there's an agreement. You know, it, it's this way. And there's something really powerful about that. And one of the, I guess, what I'm asking is how do you deal with the reactivity that maybe comes up for people? Like, how have you seen that happen for you where people are like, but I don't want to make, not that anyone should be forced to make a vow, but there's like an aspect of, have you seen people how squirreling out of it? How do you coach people to see the power of making a voluntary commitment? Yeah, so I think that it's important not to enter the pretend world for people who just aren't serious. I would just tell people, you're not serious then. If your child was in the middle of the road about to get hit by a car, I'd take care of myself. You can't, and, and yes. so you, you can't tell me that you really believe climate is going to destroy everything and everyone you love and then not get up to do the work. So I don't know which one is. It's just a pretense. It's not something that I take seriously. I don't care if people think I'm a jerk or not. It's just not serious. It's just not serious. I don't have time for that. Yeah. And it gets, if you've taken any of my courses or my master's degree, it's, we, yeah, I don't, I just point out that you can't have these two things in in the same reality at the same time. They're, they're not, it's not possible to be serious. I don't care what you say or how many articles you've written. If these are the, the obstacles between you and the work, then you're just not, you're just not serious. You can't, you can't say something like that and then blame the Russians for invading Ukraine. Because you're yes. not any more serious about change than a Russian whose country just wants them to go to war. And you're not serious. It's not. It's the same problem. You're not elevated above them. You have no right to have an opinion about that because you're not serious. But yeah, I say that to people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Oh, I really, yeah. At first, you point out the contradiction, but if then they're like stuck in their thing, then you can get more and more. It's just if you get triggered by the if you get triggered by the chainsaw on the dining room table, there's no way you can complain about Russians being triggered by the threat of NATO on their border. There, there's no comparison. One one is much more a much bigger trigger. So how can you expect them to liberate from those triggers if you can't liberate from these simple ones, territorial triggers in your very safe house? It, it, it does, it's not serious work. It's just opinions. And what, one of the things, I, so I think okay. this is amazing what then you're I saying. i got to shut this heater off. I've been trying to do it with my feet. And Go for it. Go for it. My feet aren't quite dexterous enough. <laughs> Thank you. I guess one question I have about that, that what I often see that might happen though, in a classic, let's say interpersonal conflict in community, which is the, the thing that I just watched. We've run 34 one month residencies now, I think at the Berger, the hub here, the life itself. And I've just seen again, some often breakdown, some more serious, some less. Often what happens is people will say, oh, but it's X. Now, I know the obvious thing is it's, you were like, it's my husband's chainsaw. He should have moved it. The question I'm trying to put, though, is there will be people in, that I think might reasonably say, but there are some people who are toxic. Are, are you, Benita and Rufus, advocating, like, just gaslighting? If you complain that this person is bullying, you should just got transform your own inner reactivity. So I, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm just trying to walk through what one would, because I can imagine an objection coming up from some people saying, you know, I've seen it in these conflicts. Sometimes where I'll be like, listen, or we've got involved in facilitation. Some person can be like, look, yes, I know this stuff in me, but they really are X, Y, Z, and they really are whatever it is. How, you know, or like re Putin really is, and or yes, I see that, but blah, blah, blah. How do we respond wisely to that? Like, to, yeah, what does one say in those kind of circumstances? What's the kind of developmental edge for people there? Yeah. 
Okay. Obviously, it depends. I'm, I, I have yeah, a obviously. picture in my head of a toxic individual. It depends where the toxicity is coming from. My my experience tells me. I'll just tell you what my experience tells yes. me. Yes. And then we can make it more. My experience tells me that this is not able to be managed. Toxic individuals cannot be managed by a peer-to-peer -peer group. Yes. You need, you need a leader. You need a leader. And if you norm peer to peer to the point where the toxic person is a peer, you, you have people in a double bind. Yes. So I have this theory of change. I, I presented it at the UN, and that is let me just go through it. It is what the divinity school is. Actually, the website starts with this theory of change. And that is, in the pre-modern world, people just saw themselves as part of the cycle of nature. They worked with animals were part of the cycle of nature, birth and death. And they didn't really think of like change. Let's change the world. Of course, the, the, there was an evolutionary component to how they did change the world, but th th this they didn't really take that on themselves. And then you get to the modern world and you have this creation of very strong people of, oh, and in the pre-modern world, everybody thought of themselves as the same, very pure-like. You, you're born, you die, you're born, you die. If you're a slave, your children will be slaves, these cycles, okay? And then in the modern world, we start to have this concept of exceptional talent. We have the German in the English school system, for example. We have an elite and a group of a small group of men, which were always men, could actually create the world that people lived in. So this is the change theory of change and colonialism. And it's true. They would make a contract. They'd go to another country. They changed the whole way the country was formed. In, in the U.S., a small group of people at the founding of the Republic said, we're going to take a little bit of what Germany did in their higher education, a little bit of what England did, and we're going to establish Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. They just built the foundations of the new world. Okay, that's the modern reality. And this breaks down in the 60s where people start to take their democratic uh, power seriously, and you get the postmodern activist kind of phase. And you can see this today, like Bill Gates is always trying to go into like Africa and completely change things. And the populace just pushes back and makes chaos. And they're like up yours. Bill. You can't, you don't really have that kind of uh, colonial power anymore. So you get this kind of activist where the idea is that the collective can build the world that the collective wants to live in. This breaks down because it eventually gets reduced to peer ideology, which then means all the war is mimetic warfare because there's no power hierarchy, blah, 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 the world, welcome to the world we live in. Then you have the meta-modern turn, which is exemplified by building interdevelopmental uh, uh, goals, where now the e emphasis is on the inner life of the individual. So it has a little bit of a modern reversal because the emphasis is away from the collective and on the work of the individual. So if you work on the individual and you get those people who worked on themselves together, then the it changes the collective. So again, we have inner work, individual work to change the collective. So you see this kind of different theories of change. And what we were saying is that we're not metamodernists in that sense because it can lead to a certain amount of narcissism in the human, the self-improvement industry. Yes. It's part of this. Okay, so now we're saying, no, we want a completely new combination to theory of change. And our theory of change is, what does it, what skills does it, do you need to lead, we take that word seriously, lead a group of free and willing participants? It's not peer-to-peer. -peer, and the participants are free and willing. So there's no enforced social protocols. But how can you become a leader of a group of free and willing participants? And we feel that there's four skills involved, which is the skills we want to teach in the divinity school. And I won't go into it, but 
so that's my short answer. You can't deal with toxic individuals. You can't deal with confusion at that a certain fundamental grounded level in a peer-to-peer -peer community. Yes. And so you need the emergence of a certain type of leadership, which is not a throwback. And, and their orientation to the larger group is that always, oh, these are free and willing participants. What, how, what does leadership mean when I constantly remind myself of that? Can you say a bit more about the four skills? I mean, I, yeah, the divinity school. And just to say for people listening, the divinity school is launching in next year, March, I think, spring. Yeah, spring. if you go to, and if we, you can put that. I'll put that up, in the notes. Because you can apply through that website. You and you can join the newsletter because that website might be migrated to its own URL. But if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get the updates there. What What are the four skills? Okay, then? the four <laughs> skills are awakened perception. It's an Alice move toward Alice centric per perception to see the world without narrative and projection and blah blah blah. It goes deeper than that, but I'm just giving you like the buzz. Oh, and. There's a lot of content on the website and it talks a lot about what the biomarker of all of these are. How do you know you have awakened perception? Um, the second one is um, uh, visionary scholarship. So this is about being an expert generalist, being able to track very sophisticated work, but glean the essential principles out of it, speaking with in, inquiring in a Socratic way and speaking in declarative sentences that's part of visionary scholarship the third one is crazy wisdom what's crazy about it is that you have to understand the complex causal relations in an interconnected world they're not newtonian they're not linear you also understand things that whenever we model systems we tend to deanimate part of the system and this is not real in the world. The, the causal relations are omnidirectional. So we try to teach people to think in terms of, they're not systems anymore, but, but you could call them systems where parts of the system are not deanimated. This is a big cognitive shift. And the last one is passionate action. How do you sustain enthusiasm and endurance for the work how do you understand that we've evolved for to experience pleasure in our pursuit of goals and to understand like from embodied experience how you can tie in agency with with deep joy let's say through passionate action so those are the four skills uh, that we teach and so we teach those four skills and then parallel to the skills we have two, two project tracks that you join one of them or the other. And so you're learning these skills and once a month you're working with your track. So half of the students are in one track or certain percentage of the students are in one track by choice. Another percentage of the students are the other track by choice. And then you come together for a one week retreat and you form a committee, like this, tra this track has recommendations, this track has recommendations, and then you form a, a, a group, a collective that then has to write recommendations for governments and investors on these two questions. One is the question of what are the unexplored uh, horizons of biological intelligence and the other is how can we naturalize machine agency so you work in those two tracks and then you come together and you produce a document a compelling document to steer government and uh, private investment toward the suggestions that you've come up with and then you, we rinse and repeat that every cohort culture it's 56 weeks long so you have a real meaty thing to work on as a group. That's incredible, Benita. I know we talked about it back in May and it's out. And I think we'd love to maybe, yeah, share, we can share more about that in, in the show notes, but and more generally. I guess I have one question about leadership because 
the, so just to say maybe to share briefly the sec we we since we were speaking first i think in april or may we launched the second renaissance kind of outline but particularly the theory of change which i think has a lot of connections particularly the second paper we released the white paper is about the kind of how and this idea that new a new paradigms or a new culture arises in pockets places that there are yeah. there's density of difference the point about leadership which i think is central there we talk about movement building in my experience a bit is that leadership also exists in the listening of the free and willing participants so if you're in a group where everyone's oh, we've got to be what i call horizontalism <laughs> i don't know if you know that phrase but oh, yeah no yeah, then it's very difficult, no matter what kind of leader you are, to generate it. So there's this interesting aspect where I'd say that what's also crucial is the group allows for it. And it seems to me a crucial aspect of whether you want to call it metamodern or integral or teal. Mm -hmm. or, it's this ability to allow hierarchy again in a healthy way, right? That's yeah. a common, Wilbur goes on about it and so on and, and, and so forth. And yet, it, I think this is, comes back to the thing that I have to also emphasize, that ideas are cheap implementation is costly or the hard thing about hard things yeah. which is how it's all about to say that but having groups where because often resources and power and status mm -hmm. accrue to people who are leaders there's all this resistance so creating a situation where there's healthy leadership in this way and people willingly free and willing participants give their listening to some extent to leader. And then there's, and this works in a well way. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm interested in. What kind of capacities do you think of the group? Yeah. Not just of leaders, maybe it's a group of leaders, but what are the capacities and kind of behaviors of a group that allows that kind of leadership to, to be possible? Okay. That's beautiful because just what you just performed shows the power of the question. So you imagine free and willing participants. I see one principle that has to be, because that's not a colonial leader, right? Okay, so this is extremely, this is wonderful. So that's why we asked the question that way. Okay, so when you look, one of the things is if you went into a community that worked like this, you would see a hierarchy. You would say, oh, blah, 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 I can see how things work. But it has evolved through the design of what I call a sense-making up hierarchy, okay? so. A, a down hierarchy is where instructions at the top percolate down to the bottom. An up hierarchy is where information at the local level percolates up to a, a, a superordinate level. And that information then updates the context in which the local information now is situated, okay? So one of the things in designing communities like this is yes, you lead a le leader, but the it's not like there's a person at the top. I mean, in these inter uh, interpersonal dimensions, you need a go-to person. We talked about that, but the community itself relies on a technology that is built on information flows that are a sense-making up hierarchy, and here is where AI is able to help because AI can globally, like large language modules basically have globally updated for everyone, everything anyone's ever thought of, okay? So we can use these principles of new theories of change to look at some of the tools that can help create information flows that support this new theory of change, we can look at it directly as sense making up hierarchies. If you went in and you looked, you'd say, oh, it looks like a hierarchy. But the way the hierarchy, the information flows is a very important design principle that is easy to, I can't because I'm not a coder or anything, but it's a powerful design principle that can be leveraged to help scale the community. You don't need so much technology if it's only three people or five people. But so that's another principle that we put in here. We have a lot of robust pedagogy in this program, but that's what we would unfold.
So those two tracks I talked about, like how do we naturalize, how do we naturalize machine agency? One of the design principles is a design principle from nature. They're all up hierarchies. There are a lot of people look at nature and say, oh, there's hierarchies in nature, but the energy flows are up hierarchies. They're not, they're not down, down hierarchies. Yeah, that's one way. <laughs> I could just laugh, 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 laugh forever. Well, no, this is amazing. I've got, I'm aware of uh, this session's uh, timing. So I might bring this moment because I would, maybe we can have a follow-up where we explore some things. Just questions I'll leave that I think we can come back to is, or that will be interesting to explore is, let's say, for example, the group is writing a paper and what, ha I mean, the classic thing that leadership does is maybe mediate conflict or shape and shape direction what happens when there's a conflict between a participant and a leader for example mm -hmm. one thing when we meet it there's loads of questions i might have but for now i just want to maybe yeah bring so us back let me to, talk let me just say, say that. something about that then. okay <laughs> so leadership and this is come straight out of working with stallions right so if you're going to work with a stallion, they're bigger than you they have amazing energy you're just a little human being and you don't want to use punishing technology, as this is a, an experiment I've done myself, then you have these questions like, he's a free and willing participant. Why would he want to follow me? It's not like I'm treating him or anything. So what leadership is another one of these Vipassana things. My job is to shape the horse's character. And his job is to elevate my leadership. It has to go like that. So if you're in conflict with someone and they're pushing back on you as a leader, you have to say, ah, here's my opportunity to raise my leadership, not to push them down, not to push back. That's not leadership. Now, at a certain point, it's called in, in ho the horse world, you get overfaced. You bought a stallion who just has more leadership ability than you. And when you buy a stallion you, and you have good people around you, they tell you, be prepared to sell that to someone who's got better skills than you. Because you never know. You can't fall in love with a stallion. And they want, they demand a leader. Either they're going to lead or, and they'll keep going until, oh, okay, you're my leader. Not, it never stops, really. After 14 years, I had him gelded, so his testosterone is lower and not, su not such a big deal. But this is an active, vital experience to be a leader. It's not nominal. It's not nominal. And that's part of the life spring of the community. And for horses, they're always testing their leader. And it's sad to see because as an older leader, if one of the horses is older, they start picking on them. And then they turn to someone else because... It, you threaten the life of the whole herd if you still follow a leader who can't lead. And the only way you can tell when they can't lead anymore is by constantly poking. And if they can't rise, then they have to quit. Like this is a problem we have in our politics today. Like the, these people who lead our country have no character and they have no ability to impress they have no authority to tell smart, intelligent, keen young people what to do. They have zero authority. It's just nominal sports power. Yeah. Wow. So just if we're like today coming to a close, we've gone on a journey of like why we want new kinds of leadership, why we want to create new kinds of communities, conscious communities, why we need to cultivate, I would say, like the inner capacities, but our collective inner and, right. and outer capacities. There's basically the challenge of rising to a new level of planetary civilization and where we're falling short of that. And then we really focus in the second half on, on a lot of what does it take? What are the practices? What are the things? I think the thing that I most take away is this point of the vow, the voluntary obligation. Right. To and the leader too has to have a vow to always yes. be shaping the character. This is what I vow, that this is happening, constantly happening.
Yes, the, and so this vow to participate in a theater of transformation, that's that beautiful yes. phrase, I really take with me. Anything you'd like to see, Bernita, in closing for today? What I'd like to see is people signing up for the, the Divinity School. Okay, so here's the thing about the Divinity School is we would like the first cohort to be populated by people who already are leaders. Now, this sounds weird. If you already are a pretty good leader, you're leading life itself or you're leading something, why would you take a leadership? Because the program is brand new and the quality of the first cohort will establish the robustness of the course for all time. If you think of, for example, if we just took a bunch of kids that had graduated with their BS and then they come to this master's course, they've been taught their whole life just to download information. They'd be completely blindsided by our program. So yeah. I want, I want it. So you're, and then this gives you the chance to be in a cohort with people at this very high kind of um, functioning cohort itself. So this is really who we are looking for. You have to go through an application process. And so I just want to say that it would be fantastic for us yes. to co-create the course that we envision with people who are already leaders, because then this would not only be a litmus test, but it'd be less than like hunting and pecking. What are we doing? What are we doing? And so I just want to say, make that very clear and hope that some of those natural born leaders will join us and not think like, why should I take that? We are, yeah, to co-create the, yeah, co-create the experience for all the cohorts to come. I'm just going to end and say, this sounds like the most incredible thing. I will we'll make sure the link goes out with this. And for people listening, yeah, go read through the website. It just is an incredible course. You, Benina, and Benina, it's, yeah, it's going to be an incredible And program. shout out to Corey and Zach. We spent a lot of time building it together. Just want to say yeah. that. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you. I will wrap there and feel, keep tuned to the Second Resource Podcast. Yes. This was awesome. Thank you so much for a chance to uh, announce it, announce what we're doing and where we've come and possibility of going forward.